they do some of the world's toughest jobs. There's those that are tough, and then there's those that think they're tough. <laughs> Using one of the world's toughest helicopters. The power is a narcotic. It's addictive. This heavy lifter builds towers. There's a lot of wind, a lot of noise, and it makes everybody's excitement level go up. Woohoo! That's what I'm talking about, baby! It fights fires. That was right up there. I'd put that at a nine and a half. And we did a lot of good. And it harvests high-grade timber. It's a big aircraft, but it's incredibly nimble. There's not a lot of machines that'll do that. January 2008. Come back down here. It takes nerves of steel to raise steel into the sky. The job to build a 425 meter radio tower, 9 meters and 3.6 tons at a time. Okay. Kind of it's no ordinary day at work. One helicopter, three pilots, and the tower crew work as a team. If a pilot makes a wrong move, the tower could collapse, taking the lives of the crew with it. This job will take power and precision. The tower is an engineering innovation. It's designed to be built with the air crane. From a distance, the air crane may look like a harmless dragonfly, but this beast is a powerhouse. Nearly 27 meters long and five and a half meters tall, six blades and 9,000 horsepower deliver a climb rate of 1,200 meters a minute and the ability to lift her own weight, 9,000 kilograms. The flight crew brings the air crane to life. Danger is an occupational hazard. Whether lining up a three and a half ton chunk of steel from the air. This is like driving a pickup versus a uh, semi-trailer. It takes more time to turn it and more, more effort sucking up some 10,000 liters of water to kill a raging wildfire. It's amazing how the, this job can get you uh, really caught up in what you're doing and, and maybe do some things that you uh, probably, if you saw it on a movie, would think you know, the guy's out of his mind. Or doing a little tree pruning off the side of a mountain. And when I came out here, my first uh, my first tour was it's an absolute shock. In the mountains of Nevada, Texas tower builder H. C. Jeffries is raising a 425 meter broadcast tower for Las Vegas radio station K R R N F M. The tower will be as tall as New York's Empire State Building. It's built in sections. The Texas team takes one 3.6 ton chunk of steel and stacks it on top of another. Then they bolt the pieces together. There are 48 sections. Each one is nine meters tall, the height of a three-story house. And what stops the tower from swaying, even crashing down? 12 sets of guy wires. Just like on a tent, the same principle applies. But these guy wires are made of steel. Each one weighs up to 1,400 kilograms. From here to the top of the tower, the air crane will put the sections and guy wires in place. Two men lead the project. The air crane's main man is Mark Lumrey. He's a tough ex-Marine. He's also smart. He's already built this tower inside his head. You build the tower in your sleep. You build the tower when you're eating. You think about it constantly. Uh, and try to uh, picture every detail. Herb Jeffries from Texas is a veteran tower builder. He supervises the construction of huge concrete footings for the guy wires. Six months were spent just to prepare the site for the air crane. Nothing on this job is easy. This specific site is challenging because of its location and, and the mountains. That's one reason why Herb chose to build this tower by heavy lift helicopter. 6962 Romeo, AKA Olga. Olga has had her fair share of construction firsts. 
She topped Toronto's CN Tower in 1976, making it the world's tallest freestanding structure. This tower job is every bit as dangerous. It takes three pilots to fly the air crane on a construction job. The most important is the backseat driver. Max Evans might look like he's playing a video game in the back, but his steady hand on the joystick operates the fine control that flies the three and a half ton payload into place. Construction work as horses is with people around and close tolerances. And so the back seat, which has this kind of like a fine tuning or a, the power steering port, part of it, is uh, more accurate. And so we fly from back there. And, and nobody does it better than Max. Erickson has a lot of wonderful pilots. We've worked with many of them, but Max has that special touch. The air crane sets down in the Nevada desert. The Texas team have laid out the steel sections ready for lifting. Not much else here but a fuel truck and a little shelter for pilots and mechanics. After six months of preparation, everything is ready to go. The day starts early in a desert diner. And while the tough Texans fuel up, Max completes his pre-flight check. It's time to see if the air crane is up to the job. Mark Lumry brings the tower team and the flight crew together for the crucial safety meeting. We'll be up in the tower with you guys today. Whatever problems you got, you leave them down here on the ground or actually back behind that gate. The tower team now have to face the dangers of working under a large and powerful helicopter and its six whirling rotor blades. Today, we're going to be blowing about 70 miles an hour. A rotor wash today, anything that's laying around on the ground could become a lethal projectile. I don't want to sound like a hard ass, but that's just the way it is, because I, I want to see everybody go home with all their digits, fingers, toes, and, and most importantly, their lives. It's time to build, and build fast. There will be a tower here in 10 days if all goes according to plan. It's a little stubby right now. Won't be long. Should be tall. You're, you're gonna be on HD, so you're probably gonna want to zip your pants up. All right. I got an extra beanie hat if you need it when we get up there. <laughs> the top of the tower is no ordinary work site, and everyone here knows that a fall would be deadly. Once you get up over, you know, oh, 20, 30 feet, you know you're you're high enough to you know, for your survival instinct to kick in. Mark Lumry is the only one of the air crane crew to climb the tower with the Texans. He knows how dangerous it is. We had work with some other companies and really just, uh, frankly, scared the crap out of us. Did not seem to have the mental capacity to understand that the, uh, the dangers involved. Well, I have to tell you, it's awful nice being back up in the sky with you guys. When, uh, when I'm gone, I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Down below, it's time for the final safety check. This helicopter has 55,000 parts, so crew chief Eric Weaver and mechanic Ryan Moore like to keep a close eye on things. Okay, guys, everything going good out here. Once the engines are running and the head's turning, that's when all the fluids are moving and the parts and pieces are moving. So if something is broken or not quite right or leaking, then that's our our best chance to find a problem if there is a problem. Okay, we're good. Here we go. You got it? No, you want us to go ahead and hook up there, Mark? Yep, go ahead. All right. The inverters on, the igniters are on. Now it's time to fly. Radio's on, and on. The six rotor blades on the nine ton air crane are spinning wings. They create lift. The two Pratt and Whitney turboshaft engines burn almost 1,900 liters of jet fuel every hour. This supplies the 4,500 shaft horsepower that drive the blades. The lifting power of a helicopter is also determined by the number of blades it has. The air crane's six blades and two massive engines make it one of the most powerful lifters anywhere. The lifting capability of the crane is still phenomenal. Okay, I'm just going to lift the pedal turn, okay? It's just a big monster, and it uh, just does a terrific job of lifting it. Come up a little bit higher if you want here. Okay. Still a 
the best lifter for the for the uh, for your money there. Okay, coming toward the unit. Come more in down. Yeah, you heard we hooked that blue hook, the blue hook to the uh, B leg there, ladder leg, and then the white one to the top there. Coming out of the aircraft right now. Yeah, I have it here. You got it. I got the pedal. Carefully, Max positions the helicopter to hook up the three and a half ton tower section. See channel there. Places over there. Okay, coming on our nose, Max. Herb Jeffries guides this operation. It's vital that no dirt remains on the pads at the bottom of the legs. They have to connect to the tower precisely. All right, here we go. Okay, kind of heads up there. On this first flight, Fran Tebby takes the left seat. His job is to fly the helicopter and position it into the wind over the top of the tower. Then Max will take over from the back seat. Okay, here we come. All right, I got you loud and clear up here. Uh, we're set on top. Hey, uh, Mark, what's the wind up there? 8.5 knots off a of sea leg. Off a of sea, yeah. Off a of sea leg. You can hear the helicopter pretty far off, even on a mountaintop. You can usually hear a crank. That usually gets your adrenaline going. And then once your adrenaline's going, your awareness kicks in, you know. And uh, when you become aware of it, you pretty much keep your eye on it the whole time. The blades create a downwash of hurricane force. Max must keep the three and a half ton section centered in the eye of the wash as he moves it into position. A patented anti-rotation device is key. It holds the tower section in place below the helicopter. The cable rig that holds the tower section attaches to a triangular spreader bar. This locks into a grooved ring that is fixed to the helicopter. The pilots use this system to position each section exactly where they want it. We don't have to worry about uh, things spinning around and getting out of control, hopefully. <laughs> this triangle seems like the, the spreader bar. Like when the helicopter turns, it turns this whole mechanism and uh, yet, as you can see, it, it moves back and forth and moves side to side so that the, the load can stand underneath. The helicopter can lean into the wind and do what it has to do, and the load stays straight up and down or in oriented. Once over the tower, Max takes control. The rear of the helicopter is designed for construction. Max has a wraparound view to allow him to see the load clearly and use the joystick to maneuver. You're below the guide. Unlike the operator of a ground-based construction crane, Max does not use a hoist to move his load up and down. He flies the section into position. A lot of people call him a crane operator. However, he's actually flying the helicopter. When the load goes up or down, he flies the helicopter up or down. He sets it that way. It's, really, it's a really neat deal. Max knows the lives of the crew below him are in his hands. Lowering a three and a half ton section of steel from a helicopter isn't easy. It's potentially deadly. From the top of the tower, it looks like Max is getting plenty close, even too close. Like uh, balancing on a beach ball, you, you know, you get too, too wild and crazy, you'll fall off it. Lumbry communicates with the helicopter by radio. He will guide Max's load down, centimeter by centimeter. Very intent on calling the elevation, because if he gets lower than the tower and drifts into the tower, we're all on the outside. It might look like just a touch, but these tower sections are picking up about 8,000 pounds. And there's no one I know that could withstand a, a, a brush of 8,000 pounds. To keep the men on the tower safe, Max can lower each section without help from below. At the top of each tower section, the team have fixed a set of angle guides that help to position it into exactly the right spot. The angle guides are designed to act as a funnel. This will be standing up on the tower already, and then we'll bring the top section in. It'll line up by catching this guide and slide it right into position. And this locking pin will slide through the bolt hole and lock in place and just sits it right down, just like that. Six, five, four, Back off. All the way. And cut her loose. Yeah, there's slack and cut her 
One down, 41 to go. The crew on the tower have only minutes to bolt the section into place, climb to the top of it, and be ready to receive the next one when the helicopter returns. Two more sections have gone perfectly into place, but now the team have to attach the guy wires, and that's not going to be easy. Flying lines like this will use skills that the pilots have developed on a very different kind of job. Long line logging in a very different part of the world. Air crane helicopter Mariah has her own tough job a thousand miles to the north in British Columbia, Canada. This is the backyard of Canadian air crane. Mariah hauls logs from places that are too rugged and too remote to be reached from the ground. The air crane started its civilian career in a job like this in the 70s. It was known as the Sky Crane and was a military machine facing retirement. The Sky Crane started life as the brainchild of engineering genius Igor Sikorsky. Helicopters were only 10 years old when he decided to marry the idea of a helicopter with that of a crane. He called it a sky crane. In Vietnam, it rescued 380 downed aircraft. Sikorsky's dream found a new rhythm and role in the civilian world. Rebuilt and significantly re engineered since then, it still keeps going. Today, air cranes are built at this Ericsson plant in Oregon. The Sky Crane is very unique in, in the way it was designed. Um, a lot of our engineers are still learning about the aircraft and the different stresses that we put on it that Sikorsky didn't intend it for. An American logger named Jack Ericsson began to use military surplus Sky Cranes in 1971. He liked the aircraft so much, he bought the right to the design from Sikorsky. That right is called the type certificate. You own the soul of that helicopter. You can make anything you want. You can build parts. Since then, we have got our production certificate, which enables us to build aircraft from the ground up. So having the type certificate and the production certificate makes us very unique. You know, it's, it's something. It's like taking an, an ugly duckling, and you get it. It, it looks terrible. Um, and then you actually watch it over a 10-month period and it, it morphosizes to, to a, a really nice machine, and then it's really nice when you see it fly away for its first test flight. Tranquil Inlet is on the west coast of Canada's Vancouver Island. It's beautiful, but it's a long way from anything except bears, trees, and big, heavy machinery. In the world of logging, everything is larger than life. The men, the machinery, and the sheer pace of it all. The work is relentless, repetitive, and risky. Just a challenge for the powerful air crane. If you can make it through today without having to build a junction, we'll get to have a wheel loader there first thing in the morning. Anything else I've ever flown, I've, I've never been in anything like this machine here. It's, uh, it's quite impressive what you can do. It truly really is. I mean, coming straight down the hill at, you know, three, 4,000 feet a minute descent and uh, stand it on its tail and stop. Yeah. And then 10 seconds later, you're climbing the hill at 4,000 4, feet a minute. 4,000 feet a minute, yeah. So, so it's, it's there's not a lot of machines that'll do that. The pilots squeeze out every bit of that performance, hour after hour, day after day. <laughs> the loggers measure the air crane's success in what they call turns. Each time they pick up a log and deliver it to the logging truck, that's a turn. That's the routine, up and down, turn by turn, hour by hour, up to 14 hours a day. Well, we bid our job according to how many turns an hour and a certain weight we think we're going to get. 
I hate to say this, but it's all about the crane. Just uh, make it as fast and efficient as possible. Uh, this machine does fly really nice. It does, doesn't it? I just got to get used to it. But now, yeah. The air crane can lift a log that weighs some 6,800 kilograms. Mariah can haul up to 200 logs a day. More logs means more money. There's the other one. That is 13. The lifting power of the air crane makes the impossible possible, and the pilots love the power. As you increase the power, the engines begin to, to scream louder and louder. They get to that perfect screaming pitch, and then you leave your power set, and away you go. Sometimes we scream uh, with the engines at each other, too. <laughs> this logging crew does not simply work their way up the mountain and cut everything in their path. Here, the days of clear cutting are over. A Canadian First Nations company called ESOC operates this logging concession. ESOC has a different approach. You can't see much from here, can you? But there's uh, several hectares of area there that's being harvested. So. They call it variable retention logging. Part of the forest is always left intact. But a heavy lifter like the air crane is essential for this job. That was fun. We use that machine because it's able to lift the timber straight out of the canopy without damaging the, the retention that we're leaving behind. If you're harvesting using more conventional methods, you generally have to clear uh, swaths to get the equipment in to work. With the helicopter, you've got a bit more flexibility in terms of what you can take and leave in, within a small area. Are you here or is it higher up? Is there another pad up? You should have a pad in the middle of that block there, Bob, right and then that lower section's been painted there. We can... You gonna grab it again? No, I'm gonna try and pull this thing over from <laughs> under it. Rolling the dice, eh? Holy cow, what am I doing now? There's 19. Pounds. Fewer trees are damaged, but the pilots find it tough going. Beautiful. So uh, with dispersed retention, it's just harder. Sometimes they have to grab the turn, take it right up over top of the trees, and put it down right back down on the other side and try not to uh, do any damage to the retention. And it's very difficult for them. The pilots take full advantage of the air crane's surprising capabilities. It's a big aircraft, but it's incredibly nimble. For such a large aircraft, you can move, make very quick little moves with the helicopter that allow you to fly the grapple and, and build turns the way we do. Yeah. The pilots grab the logs using a hydraulic grapple on the end of a 60 meter cable or long line. Ooh, what's the weight of that? 14. <laughs> That's a quarter. 14,000 pound quarter. Yeah. There you go, 14,000 pound quarter. With practice, they learn to make the physics work. If the grapple is spinning, it's just like a figure skater. If, it, if you want it to spin faster, you close it, like a figure skater pulling their arms in. If you want it to slow down the, uh, the spin of the grapple, you open it up and it'll slow down. So as we're coming in to grab a log, we're trying to control the spin of the grapple by opening it and closing it very slowly to get the rate of spin so that it lines up with the log as it goes on and then we close on the log. But of course, the grapple doesn't always cooperate. That inanimate piece of steel is probably the most seems, frustrating thing we have to deal with. Seems like it has a mind of its own sometimes. And yeah, I can get pretty kind of frustrating. Yeah. While the grapple is an effective tool, it's also dangerous. The swipe of this would be lethal. The pilots are aware of that and are constantly scanning for crews on the ground. Safety is always number one. Huh? Yeah, you're right at our three o'clock. New air crane crews earn their wings, or at least try to, flying long lines like this. Air crane captain Chris Woods has been flying long enough to work out what it takes. Generally speaking, I think they're overachievers. Um, we like to uh, we like to do a good job. Chris or Doug, if you guys can put the grapple in the uh, same position the other one when you come down, we're going to put a warning to service. Thank you, Chris. Yep. And you want to just go by the door, right? Yeah. Please and thank you. As in Nevada, a crew of mechanics maintains the Canadian air crane. Their job is every bit as tough as the pilots. The mechanics must perform two man hours of maintenance for every hour flown. All right, we're just waiting on fluid. All right. Each part on a helicopter has a set lifetime. When that time is up, it has to be replaced. 
logging is very demanding on the helicopter. Um, you know, there's a lot of maintenance involved, a lot of inspections. We fly a lot of hours, so you can imagine that we're constantly looking after the machine and inspecting it. And danger is a way of life for the air crane crews, especially when they face something that has never been done before. The team in Nevada now have to fly the guy wires into place. The Texas Tower Builders attached two sets of guy wires before the air crane arrived. Grueling work in this tough terrain. Once the team fastened the guy wires to the tower and the anchors, they added tension until the tower was straight. The pilots have to fly the rest of the guy wires from the valley below into the waiting hands of the men on the tower. In theory, this job should be just like flying the long lines used for logging. But these guy wires are much longer, some more than 800 meters. The guy wires are going to be laid out uh, at the site and have to be flown in, basically like a long line. These are going to be the longest guy wires we've flown, correct? That's right. That's, oh, to my know. knowledge, it's the longest anybody's flown. It would be 20, you know, 2,700 feet long. These are just a different kind of load. I mean, we with uh, long line logging, we generally operate with 200, 250 feet or our standard cable lengths. Even Max Evans is worried. Hauling these long guy wires up is the trickiest part and, and most nerve wracking. To a construction pilot, control of the load is everything. And these guy wires are difficult to control. As you make an input, the momentum in the middle of the line will start swaying back and forth and, and kind of whipping the bottom of the line, like cracking a whip. With men on the ground and on the tower, this lack of control is potentially deadly. The heavy steel cable could take off a man's head with just one flick or sever an existing guy wire. That could bring the tower down. Uh, yeah, we could touch it or hit it or pop a guy wire or something like that. You, you worry, think about that. It's, those are the things that uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and. Uh, we're going to dream about or something like that. But there's a job to be done, and no one on this crew will run away from the challenge. And I'm still searching for the tail here. OK, I'll come up there a little bit. Uh, got it. Looks good. He still don't have it off the ground yet. Once in the air, another problem. The line is so thin that the pilots often can't see the end. Right now we have road cones and ribbons tied onto the end of the line and a windsaw. It's low tech, but it may help. Can you imagine what it's going to be like the last two, three? And we have to pick up the whole length of the uh, guy wire, rather, uh, anywhere from 700 to 2,000 feet long, and fly it up to the tower and get the bottom of it uh, set down close to the anchor somewhere. And you learn some techniques. I think that's basically all you can do is re recall your, the techniques that you use for a shorter line and, and try to apply those to a a very, very, very long line. Looking good, Bruce. Spotters on the ground can help, too. About 10 high. See the spot. 10 high, yeah. OK, go ahead and set her down anywhere in there. Come on down, come on down. You're trying to fly with a, we call it a lag time. The lag time between the input we make in the helicopter and the time the end of that cable responds with these longer lines is probably running about 15 seconds. OK, you're about 15, 20 feet above the ridge. That's pretty nerve-wracking because we don't dare touch any of the anchors now because there are people are in the tower, obviously. pilots have placed one end of the wire safely down on the ground, they still have to deliver the other end to the tower. Four, three, two, you have to be pretty careful so that you don't have a closure rate too fast and slap the guy wire into the tower. Too. Their shoulders are only eight, 10 inches away, and, and we have a cable that weighs 3,000 pounds, and if it happens to get across their safety rope, I mean, and, and that would, to drop, I mean, it would just uh, cut the rope off like a scissor, so. Guys, that one went well. Yeah. I got it. Just trim off. Trim 
The only solution is care and anticipation. Yeah, thanks for your help. And so you set up an approach miles, you know, a mile or two out versus maybe a couple hundred feet out, you know, with a long line. You just have to uh, slow the plan down a bit and, and just think farther ahead, basically. One by one, the pilots fly the cables into position. The tower grows. The crew has done something no one has done before. When things go right, that, that's when it feels really good. When uh, the, everything from the liftoff here to the, to the approach, uh, right down to the set, everything feels coordinated and it feels like the team really meshes together. Um, you know, from, from our flying the helicopter to Mark's calling it in, right to the point where they say, yep, the bolts are in, cut or loose, that feels really good. As the air crane crew in Nevada build a tower towards 125 meters, another air crane crew some 10,000 kilometers away faces a very different challenge. Sardinia, Italy. It's another long, hot summer. Everyone knows what's coming. It's only a matter of when. For now, there's nothing to do but wait, kill time, try to relax. This is the downside of a hot, dry climate. Every year, wildfires ravage Sardinia. Uh, we face the fire like to facing a, a war. I mean, we know that uh, every initial year, the war will be declared, and we can only expect to win the battle. In this war, people, property, and livestock are the victims. Each day brings a new battle. This is the local command center in Oristano, where the air crane is based. Their most powerful weapon, November 159 AC, more affectionately known as Helitanker Camille. She is one of four European air cranes stationed across Italy, on call, ready to fight the fires. Captain Randy Irwin has to be ready at a moment's notice to fight any fire, anywhere on the island. He spent six years flying with the U.S. Navy. He understands risk. You take calculated risks uh, every time you go and fly, and it's how you manage that risk. It's how you plan ahead for it and uh, deal with it that, I guess, makes it dangerous or not dangerous. On fires, two pilots fly the air crane. Irwin's partner, Luca Gioso, is the vital liaison with the local firefighters. You get very bored sometimes, but very busy in a, in a few seconds. You, know, you get the phone call and then everything starts. This time it's a brush fire. On a heavily populated island, a forest or brush fire can easily and quickly become a human catastrophe. The local fire commander is always concerned. It's not only a problem with a bushfire, with nature. But it's a problem because there's many houses and people close by. So we have to protect human life. Out on the tarmac, Chief Mechanic Frank Grooms and his team have the air crane prepped and ready to go at all times. Um, my first priority is the aircraft, keeping the aircraft serviceable and ready for flying. Okay, boots on, drawn, gates are open. Okay. Here comes the main gearbox chip. Hey, chips are high. Detected. Okay. Fuel and fuel. Clear on two. Clear on two, clear turn. Clear right. I'm clear left. Camille's firefighting beat covers the entire island of Sardinia. It's an area of 24,000 square kilometers, about the same size as the state of Israel. Cruising at 190 kilometers an hour, Camille can quickly attack a fire almost anywhere on the island. 
12 o'clock. You can see where the expression spreads like wildfire comes from. Right now, this fire is winning. Every available resource in the area has been recruited. A Canada Air water bomber, three smaller helicopters, and now Camille, the air crane. Okay, I got the little helicopter down below on this flank. This is an air traffic controller's nightmare and a real challenge for the pilots. The first task is to check in with the director on the ground. Gioso gets an on-site briefing on the fly. Lama? Again, the guy is going to tell me who is going to be around, all the helicopters or the Canadairs or whatever. This is the H-Line over here, huh? the other aircraft left. It's a relatively small bit of airspace, so uh, radio communication is, uh, is really important. And everybody is calling out uh, their position when they're coming out of the water, coming into the fire, or departing the fire. Okay, I have a candidate going away. Okay, is there more than one candidate? I think there's only one. Okay. It really helps because when you're approaching the fire and you hear the Canadair say that he's 30 seconds out, you know, you have a pretty good idea that he's fairly close uh, and that, that helps you pick him out. Now it's time to find water. Uh, I think it's too small. In the river? No, no, it's right there. Oh, yeah. No, it's too small. The well, difficult thing for me probably is uh, uh, looking at two absurds where to pick up water if it's not dangerous. That it's not too small or too shallow or uh, too dangerous. It's the only word that I can say. This. Unlike the slimline air cranes used for construction, the firefighting variety has a massive belly attached. This tank can hold nearly 10,000 liters of water, and it can fill up almost anywhere. There's a large lake nearby. This allows the pilots to use the sea snorkel. Over open water, the pilot lowers the sea snorkel to 45 degrees, five and a half meters below the landing gear. The pilots fly at 25 or 30 knots, or 50 to 55 kilometers an hour, and the pressure drives the water into the tank. Uh, the sea snorkel here has two inlets, and this is where the, the water is forced into these tubes, and they come up here and join together and then go right on up into the tank. No open water? Plan B is a giant vacuum hose that can fill the tank in 45 seconds. Get forward here a little bit. Okay, release the snorkel. Then easy. And these guys will suck up water from any source, a river, a pond, your own backyard swimming pool. A couple of times we had a little bit of problems. Last year we picked up water from a fish farm and we didn't know, I saw the people get a little mad and they sue us for a little thing. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> the fire director is the ultimate boss here, but on this fire, he defers to the pilots who have a bird's eye view. Or sometimes they just tell us, you see better than us, just do what you can, do what you want. <laughs> just uh, they let us do it. Okay, we'll go left to right, and then turn around and repeat. Oh, this guy's gonna be in for a real surprise. This time, Irwin can see that a house is in the path of the fire. So I'm just, I'm just keeping the altitude up here, Luca. Yep. And just uh, letting this stuff rain down inside. And I'm off the drop now. That should be it. Clear my side. The danger averted. There is still work to do. Let's get you see that heavy fire on the far side of the Canada drop. Well, I'm on the back side of that. Got it. Almost 12 o'clock low. Got him. And okay, now. Come right. Now, come right. There you go. There you go. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's set. Go. Even when dousing the flames, the pilots have to look out for other dangers. You've got to divide your attention to so many different aspects inside the cockpit as, as well as out. Because Irwin's focus is on the flying, Gioso becomes a second set of eyes. All the things that he cannot see outside, I try to look for him. There's one giant in the sky you don't want to tangle with, the massive Canadair water bomber. Even an experienced pilot like Irwin can be caught off guard. Well, certainly there are times when you get surprised. You, 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 uh, you lose track of a particular helicopter. You think you have them all pegged, you know where they are, and 
you come up over a hill and boom, there's one right in front of you. I don't know. Um, there's been some close calls, but uh, nothing that I've lost any sleep over yet. But traffic isn't the only hazard. Got the wires. Then he's not going to be better. He's going to come around to the right and just come down the valley. Yep. Tell him uh, if he doesn't know it already that there are a bunch of wires down in the valley. The wires, the transmission lines, distribution lines, they get smaller and smaller. Uh, little telephone lines. Uh, they're all a big concern to us because on a bright, clear day, they're hard enough to see. But then when you uh, get in the middle of a smoky area, uh, they become doubly difficult to, uh, to detect. Both of us, the pilot and co-pilot, spend a lot of time identifying wires. OK, I got a set of wires out in front of me. I can't tell where they're going, though. Uh, looks like they go down the hill from where they're at. All of the pilots working on this fire are pros, but at the end of the day, they're only human, and that can be a dangerous thing. Is our llama up here on this fire? I think he's another one. He's talking to Sassari. Llama oh, still might be. Probably the most dangerous thing a guy in a fire might encounter is, is his own ego, uh, letting his ego fly the machine. You know, there comes a point when you have to ask yourself, am I doing something here that is really stupid? Uh, for what? And, and maybe back off and, and, uh, and be a little bit more conservative. Uh, there's not a bush out there that's worth uh, the helicopter or, or your life. I got to tell you, though, Luca, I'm very, very impressed. Very happy with you. Thank you, man. I love from the back. We need to make a captain out of you. Oh. Today, all egos were left back at base. The operation is a complete success. The fire's beaten. It's time to go home. Time to savor victory. <laughs> the best moment? <laughs> After 8 o'clock when we go home. <laughs> no, no, that's some, some exciting moment, even on the flight, during the flight. Uh, especially when the fire is... Uh, you know that you, uh, you finish the fire, and you extinguished all the fires. It's, 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 it's fun. It's, I like it. I like it. This was about as good as it gets. The water source was real close, and uh, and we did a lot of good. We saved saved a couple of houses, uh, or at least stopped, kept the fire from going into the house. Um, so that was right up there. I'd put that at a nine and a half. Oh, I feel uh, really buzzed, really good. Tired, I mean, physically tired, but uh, I feel like a beer. That's what I feel like. While this battle ends in triumph, the air crane's war will continue for months. Four, four, three. Back in Nevada, the plan to build a 425 meter transmission tower by helicopter is working well. All seems right with the world. When it goes right, it, uh, it goes right real fast, and, it, and that's what right is. And everyone wants it to go right, because the pilots find it much more difficult to place the sections as the tower rises. The higher you get, the farther away from the ground you get, the less references you have, and, and so it's, uh, it's very tricky. And this section will be trickier than most. This is section 13 of 48, and it has some nasty surprises in store. This is the most dangerous moment of the operation. Before the pilot can release the section, it has to be connected securely to the tower, and this section is off-center. More, more left. Squeeze left. It's just off here. Oh, okay. Half on and half off. The pilot can't leave, and it could get worse. If it can't be fixed, the only solution, an emergency release mechanism, and that would leave an unsecured and unstable section hundreds of meters in the air. So at that point, we would hope that the aircraft is working properly and, and uh, nothing happens there that we'd have to uh, pull away or um, release it prematurely. Now the helicopter is all that's holding the three and a half ton section in place. We're on that one now. And we're off on the other two. On the tower, Lumry knows how dangerous it is. Instantly, you, you're looking for the, the fastest way to make it safe. 
But how? The section isn't cooperating. When it comes up, it's lining up, but when it comes down, it's not. We're not quite perpendicular to the uh, faceplate, and consequently, uh, you can get two, two of the legs in, but the third leg of the triangle just ob obviously won't fit. They just have to work it and not let anything get out of control. One thing you have to fight is getting focused on, on one leg or one bolt when the other, you know, the other two legs might be doing all kinds of crazy things and you're worried about the one bolt. So you have to force yourself to use your peripheral vision all the time. Max uses every flying trick he knows. One more left. Coming left. Three showing. Coming around. There it is. There. But it's not working. Max now realizes he's running out of time. The section refuses to cooperate. The only solution now? Remove one of the guides and hope that it will help. A last resort. Coming right. Clear. Clear. Six. Hey, what do we want to do here then? I'm going to pull this left rear pin out and it'll go together. Okay, we'll just sit here then. So they had to uh, unthread the safety pin. And uh, that takes also takes one of those orange guides off that helps me align the thing. All right, we got the guide and the pin off on the left rear, and it should make fun. Oh, you got the guide off, too? Yeah, I thought they could put it in upside down or something like that and put the guide back on. The air crane burns fuel quickly. The pilots can rarely afford to wait around. This time, they're lucky. You got 45 minutes of fuel, Max. These are all green, plates clean. It's good inside. When a three and a half ton section of steel behaves badly, Lumry must keep his cool. That's when the tension comes, and it comes pretty hard and pretty fast, and then it, you have to concentrate on keeping your voice, uh, not belying that tension through the radio to the pilot, because the last thing you want is a tense pilot. Yes, Easy up. There's one, two, two, one, high inches, low inches, there you go. Good boy, that's a little hard one there, huh? Yeah. And she's just hanging up there a little bit. When you get tense and your shoulders come up and you start getting kind of jerky on the stick and that, and it translates to what's happening on the bottom. So you want him as calm and relaxed and nice, smooth inputs like Max always does. One. There, go easy down, easy down, easy down. Two, there's one, 60. That front pin must not have been in there, huh? All of it. Yeah, it was coming loose. It's hanging up on this pin here. But tiny move by tiny move, they work this section into a stable position. With two legs secured, the tower team can fix the last one themselves. And uh, sometimes steel has its own idea of where it wants to go. And uh, a little bullpen and a hammer, you can make it do about whatever you want to. Cut her loose. Back off, cut her loose. One more example of why Max is the man. The pilots are so good, though, that they're so used to dealing with emergency situations and stuff. They're so cool and calm. And they, uh, you just stay there until you work your way through it, because you know, what else can you do? When you work with the world's toughest helicopter, danger is just part of the job. Three weeks after Olga's arrival, the tower reaches 425 meters. There's a brief moment of celebration, but Olga and her team are ready to move on, ready for the next challenge, wherever the air crane takes them.